Hey there, welcome to Church 180 Online. My name is Tony, and I'm the lead pastor here. Happy Halloween. I know that may, if you've been in a church for a long time, that may be a controversial thing to say, um, because uh, Halloween is a, a day on our calendar, right, that is marked by darkness. Um, I was thinking about this, you know, on the one hand, there's there's candy corn, there's fall leaves, which I love that we have some deciduous trees in my neighborhood. Uh, there's candy trick-or-treating, football games, but then there's like houses everywhere around this time of year that do the creepiest things. Like there's like this creepy like witch sitting by a garage at a house near my house. And, and it kind of flutters in the wind. And the other day I looked at this thing as a sunset and it kind of gave me the chills. It was creepy. And then I have, you know, an eight-year-old do- a girl who like sees this stuff and like, Dad, can we make our house creepy? And I'm like, no. Like, we're not making a creepy house. It's not, it's not what we're going to do. I mean, there's just something about Halloween that's marked by darkness. I don't know your history with it or, or where you've been with Halloween. I remember dressing up as Michael Jordan and Garth Brooks and things like that growing up um, and everything. But, uh, you know, I went to a church that every couple of years took a different stance on Halloween in a lot of ways, depending on which lead pastor, you know, we had at the time. It was like, well, Halloween's from the devil, so we're going to have an alternative thing. And Halloween's for fun. Let's do trick-or-treating and trunk-or-treats or whatever, you know. And, uh, um, and, and there's just something about Halloween that's marked by darkness. And I'm not here to, like, say it's bad. I'm not here to say it's good. I'm just here to say what is it is marked by darkness. And see, darkness is, is a funny thing in and of itself, isn't it? Because darkness isn't actually a thing. Um, like darkness, it, it literally is an absence of, of a thing. It's the absence of light. Um, darkness isn't a, like darkness and light are not two contrasting things. Light will always overcome darkness because darkness is only the absence of light. And see, um, this uh, this idea of uh, darkness around Halloween, okay, it, it's it, it it's kind of I'm not even gonna say it, it it's kind of fun for a lot of people, um, but you know around a specific day and whatever and like creepy witches sitting in behind a garage, it's kind of fun for some people and, and everything. Not for everybody, but it's kind of fun for some people. But here's the thing that is true for all people when it comes to darkness. Darkness is can be fun when it comes to Halloween, but it's it's not fun when it marks certain areas of our lives, is it? It's not fun when it's a relationship that fell apart. It's not fun when it's a crippling addiction or a secret. It's not fun when it's a diagnosis um, or a phone call with some unexpected news. It's not fun when we're constantly on a hamster wheel of, of image management. And I don't know what it is for you, but there are areas of our lives that need light to shine in them, aren't there? Um, so on this Halloween, um, after a couple of weird years, uh, right in a row, um, I want to open up the scriptures to a couple of main texts dealing with light and how it affects our lives. Okay, so um, here we go. I want to look. I want to look at what Jesus said about himself being a light in the darkness. Um, but I want to give you a little bit of context. Okay, um, before we jump in, two things. Okay, Jesus at this at this moment and Jesus at this time is sparring with religious leaders, okay? He, this is before, the, you know, this this famous passage in John chapter 8, which is what we're going to cover, John chapter 8, verse 12. Um, but Jesus is sparring with the religious leaders of the day. They've just caught a woman in adultery, and, uh, and, and it's the, you know, it's the line in the sand moment where Jesus says, he who has no sin can throw the first stone. So the woman's been caught in adultery, and Jesus is sparring with these religious leaders in the moment. And the question and the controversy surrounding this moment is the question of who Jesus is, who he is. And, and see, this is also in correlation with Jesus' teaching at the Feast of Tabernacles, in which many of the emblems and the ceremonies and celebrations throughout the, the, the feast and the festivals, um, it, it remembered the light that God gave the Israelites. I, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Exodus, or you've read the story of Exodus from the Bible, but we saw that, that God gave them a, a a cloud by day and a pillar of fire, light by night, to guide their journey along the way. And so this festival, these these things was marked by light, and it was marked by all these different significant, um, you know, architecture pieces and whatever that, that that would help them remember how God had provided for them through 
light. And then Jesus, on the heels of this festival, op- uh, opens his mouth and he gives this phrase. And so at this festival, Jesus opens his mouth and he says this. He says, when, when, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said this. He said, I am the light of the world. <laughs> Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. See, there's so much going on here. For, 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 for one, I am is one of the seven statements uh, in the book of John where the statement is, is Jesus is referring to himself as God, very controversially, um, very uh, much so offending the religious leaders of the day that would have been listening to him at this time. And he's saying this statement, I am, that echoes Exodus back in Exodus chapter 3, um, early on in the Bible, where Moses says, who am I to tell people that sent me. And and God speaks to Moses and says, tell them that I am sent you. I am the the first. I am the last. I'm the beginning. I am everything. It's this almost verb of a statement, meaning that I am everything. And Jesus reiterates this, this statement, referring to himself as God saying, I am, referring back to that moment, But then he also throws on, I am the light of the world. In a world that's marked by darkness, on a day that's marked by darkness, um, I am, Jesus says, I am the light. And those who, he says, those who, um, who follow me will never walk in darkness. See, there are areas of our life that need to be illuminated. There are areas of our life that need light to shine on them and, 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 and that, that we will have the light of light when we follow Jesus. Um, so here's, here's the deal. Um, I want to give you two foundational truths and then I want to um, give you some very practical steps um, on to how, how, how to have light in your life. Okay. Number one is this. Jesus is the light of the world. That's a foundational truth. But it is this, that Jesus is the light of the world. And see, and then number two, um, for, what, for what I want to cover, number two is, uh, is found in another passage. This is Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, and the most famous sermon ever given, the Sermon on the Mount. And this is the beginning, and Jesus says this to his followers and the people that are listening. He says this, you, okay, he's already said, I am the light of the world. Now he says to his followers, he says, you are the light of the world. Okay, a town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Um, In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your father in heaven. And see, number two, the second foundational truth, first one is that Jesus is the light of the world. And the second one is that Jesus' followers are also the light of the world. We are meant to reflect the main light that we get from Jesus to the world around us. So Jesus' followers are also the light of the world. See, this is this is in how we love. This is in how we serve. And this is in how we point people to Jesus with our lives. It's, it's literally like the greatest command, love God, love people. This is how we love people. This is how we serve people. And this is how we point people to Jesus in the world around us. This is one of the reasons why I'm excited to announce today what's actually going to transpire and what's actually going to happen um, over the next couple of weeks. See, we have the, op- the unique opportunity to feed 100 families Thanksgiving dinner. Um, this year. I'm, I, I'm so excited about this. It's going to be a drive through event. Um, the San, South San Diego Police Department, had, along with um, one of our own, Veronica Medina, have chosen 75 families um, in need at this time of year that, that are going to um, be receiving um, a Thanksgiving meal kit from us in, in their trunk. Um, but also, too, like our, our very own Tracy Owens, who works for Support the Enlisted Project, has chosen 25 military families, lower-ranking military families that um, obviously live in a very expensive place and are struggling this time of year. And we're going to have the opportunity to feed those 25 families in addition to the 75 um, families in need that Veronica will be choosing with the South San Diego Police Department. And so we're going to feed 100 families, okay? And so here's what we're, here's what we're after. Um, in our courtyard, in live and in person today, we're going to have sign-ups for all this stuff. Sign-ups for um, uh, just the different food that is going to be needed. Like basically, we're going to ask people next week on November 7th, we're going to ask people to come in and bring with them non-perishable items. So um, I, 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 I'm, 
I'll be able to drop hopefully in the comments and stuff like that what those exact items are. I know we're going to need, we need some corn, we're going to need some green beans, we're going to need some gravy and stuff like that. You can also give via our website and uh, indicate that you want it to go towards Thanksgiving um, and, and stuff. So we want people to bring um, non-perishable items for Thanksgiving dinner next week. And then the week after, we need people to bring onions and potatoes. Uh, we need five pound bags of potatoes and bags of onions with like three little onions in them. And that's gonna be part of the meal kit. That'll be on the 14th. Next week is non-perishable items. You can give on our website to go towards that. But we, we are doing this because we want to be a light in the darkness, not only as individuals, but also as a church. Church. This is why we're doing a huge Christmas offering this year. If you're just tracking with us, go to church180sd.com, click the link that talks about a generous Christmas, and nominate uh, an organization or a charity locally that you believe is making a difference. And then starting on November 28th, we're going to start collecting a huge offering and just give 100% of it away to the community around us that we believe are making an impact and a difference, all in the name of Jesus, and to be a light to the world around us. You individually get to be a light, and you collectively as his church, as part of Church 180, get to be a light in the world around us. I want to talk about how we typically light up the world around us, right? And how we've been called to light up the world around us, okay? Um, I think that for, you know, we, we kind of understand, like, especially if you've been in church for a long time, we kind of understand Jesus is the light of the world. I'm supposed to be a little, you know, this little light of mine. I'm supposed to be a light in the world as well. But I think a lot of times in life, um, we go around uh, you know, shining our light a little bit like, a little bit like that, you know, a little bit like, oh, I got, I got my light out and, you know, and, uh, and, you know, and I'm gonna, whatever, you know, whatever. And, and I feel like that, that we, we get out, you know, our little light and, and we shine it in, in a lot of ways, you know, in, in some ways, because we, you know, we, 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 you know, we love people, but we don't love everybody like we love people who add value to our lives we love people who are easy to love and love people who are you know who love us back um, we serve when it's convenient in a lot of ways um, and there's nothing better to do with our lives if, if you know that we love serve others uh, we point people to Jesus like occasionally but we don't like get too crazy about it and like make it you know part of our intentional routine or habit or investment or whatever and and you know and so we kind of walk around and we've got these like little lights and I think that the reality is is that we serve a God who's the light of the world who's called us to be the light of the world and the light that he's calling us to shine should look a little bit more like this right like a searchlight a spotlight um you know like that that, 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 that lights up the world around us and then and it helps people find their way to him I mean we serve a God who legit like with his last breath like prayed for the people murdering him. That's who we serve. We serve a God who prayed for his enemies with his last breath. Um, it, it, you know, I, I think that the spotlight, you know, the searchlight love is, is loving our enemies in addition to, to all the easy ones. Um, it's serving sacrificially with our lives, even when it's not convenient. It's rhythmically and with intentionality investing into people and pointing them to Jesus. And see, and I, and I think we live in a world where all too often we just are, are settled with our little cell phone lights and, and we're like, well, I'm a little light, you know, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And, 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 and I think God's saying, no, 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 I got more for you. I got more that I want to do in and through you when it comes to that. So here's what I want to do for a few moments. I just want to talk for a couple minutes about how to turn the light up in your world. Number one is this, let the light Jesus lead your next steps. Let the light Jesus lead your next steps steps. See, a couple years back, I um, was doing a DIY project and I was making a porch swing because we lived in East Lake for a while 
and um, things seem to get stolen on people's porches. So now we moved down to Ocean View Hills in our new house. And I'm like, I want a porch swing and I want a swing that absolutely no one's going to be able to steal. And so I couldn't find any like actual plans online. So I just started making stuff up and I built a bench and I used to have a picture of the bench coming up and sitting there with my girls. And I knew I wanted like ropes because I'd seen that at Better Buzz and, and you know, Better Buzz Coffee up in PB like has um, just these incredible swings. But then I also knew I couldn't have it be like really big and tall because it would obstruct things and get in the way. So it'd have to be like kind of like this design thing. And, and so like through Google, through Pinterest, through Better Buzz, um, through driving around, um, I started to hodgepodge and put together this swing. Voila, you're gonna see a little picture of it and, and, and everything. And it was it was fun. I mean, I remember getting stuck at one point in sturdiness and like subconsciously in the middle of my sleep at 6 a.m. I like woke up with the perfect idea of what to do, waited for Home Depot to open, went and bought the stuff and made it happen. But it was a hodgepodge DIY project. It was amazing and fun to pull off. And um, see, yo, we live in this weird world and point in time right now where, where we can end up doing the same thing with our faith. And I think that that's cool and it's fine and it's fun when it comes to a swing, but it can lead us to darkness when we, we treat our faith that way. See, we DIY our faith. I put in my notes this way. We DIY our faith a little bit with a little Bible. You know, we get a little Bible in there. We get a little prayer. We get a little Google, you know, in there. We get a little Instagram, you know, getting it in. And whatever your flavor, you know, we throw a little Fox News in with our faith or we throw in a little CNN or, or you know, whatever your flavor is politically. And we start to add that into our spirituality and into our faith. And, you know, just a little of this and a little of that and go back around here and Google this here. And we can start to hodgepodge and DIY our faith. And here is the thing that I will preach and proclaim to you that will lead you to darkness because you are going to gravitate towards the voices that you agree with and repel the voices that you disagree with. You are going to literally rip pages out of your Bible, not literally, but metaphorically rip pages out of your Bible that you have no intent on obeying or following or letting Jesus lead and guide your steps and it will not work out well for you. See, the Old Testament has... Uh, um, many references of God bringing light. One of my favorites is Psalm um, 119, verse 105, and it says this, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light to my path, meaning your word, who Jesus is the word. He is the light of the world, and he is meant to lead and to guide our next steps. See, he wants to lead and guide our next steps. I don't know what that is for you. Maybe that's starting a relationship with him or connecting um, with him more. Maybe it's connecting more with your church family. Uh, maybe it's investing in someone that God's put in your life. Maybe it's giving um, or serving for our Thanksgiving um, event. I definitely think that's one of them. Uh, maybe it's serving sacrificially someone or some people in your life or in this church. Maybe it's beginning to give your giving journey or your generosity journey with the church or with, you know, some outside organization um, and, and everything. Uh, but Jesus wants to help and he wants to lead and he wants to guide your next step. So let the light lead your next steps. Number two is this, let the light, if you want to turn the light up in your life, okay? Number two is this, let the light Jesus bring healing to areas of your life. Bring healing to areas of your life. So I was I was kind of thinking about this and, and um, I, I a lot of times go into my, um, my middle daughters that we call them the biddle and the yiddle, the big little and the, and the young little. And, uh, and I go into their room and they have these bunk beds at night and they don't, they're not clean. Like my oldest is like, she's tidy and keeps her room nice and clean. And they don't, they, their room's always a muck. It's a mess. It's crazy. And so I go in there a lot of times I'm tired and I just want to sing their songs and pray with them and, and put them to bed and forget it, you know, forget about the whole clean your room and help you and all that stuff. So the lights are off. It's dark in the room, whatever. And so I'll start to sing the song and inevitably, um, most of the time Kelsey will make her way up to, to say goodbye and she'll flip on a light switch real quick and she'll look and she'll be like, oh no, this is not okay. <laughs> this is not okay. And, uh, and we have to clean it up. And with the light on, we find where all the little stuff goes into these little nooks and crannies and pockets and corners and stuff. And, and I think that, that Jesus works that way in our lives. When we let the light heal areas of our lives. 
When he comes into our life, it exposes things. It exposes the disorder. It exposes the chaos of our lives. It exposes the areas that need his healing touch. And only whenever that light floods into our lives do we have the opportunity to see what's wrong and to fix it and to take care of it with his help. Um, See, coming to Jesus is like turning on the light in a messy room. And he can help us put things back in order. And I don't know what that is for you, whether that's an addiction or a strained relationship or unforgiveness or hopelessness or selfishness or pride or arrogance or lust or greed or whatever. I don't know what's disordered in your life and chaotic in your life. But when the light floods into your life, it, it brings about the opportunity for him to heal areas in you. I love this quote by Dallas Willard. He said, a carefully cultivated heart which is what God's after will is assisted by the grace of God um, for see, forestall, or transform most of the painful situations before which others stand like helpless children saying, why? Why? He's saying God wants to put order into your heart um, in this life. Number three is this. Let the light Jesus provide the hope that you're searching for. Let the light Jesus provide the hope that you're searching for. See, hope is what makes this life worth get living right we chase it down through a career image security success finances pleasure self-fulfillment relationships one-upping our kids their opportunities etc every day all day we are all searching scrapping clawing and fighting for hope hope's what makes life worth living and see we believe that all of these things that we look for hope in we believe that they're going to save us from insignificance and they're going to make our life matter and worth living. And we're scr- scratching and clawing for hope. See, I was thinking about this, and I, I came across this story um, uh, from, from the 1970s, 1978, actually. And it was of a small Cessna 188 airplane. Um, and there was a couple of them that needed to be transported from right here in California um, to Norfolk Island, which is just north of New Zealand, but off the coast of Australia. I wanna, and it's an Australian territory. And so these are tiny little planes that you might see flying out of Brownfield Airport and, and stuff. Heck, maybe it took off from Brownfield. I didn't look that up. But, um, but there was going to be a four-stop journey over to Norfolk Island. And um, what's his name? A guy named Jay Proshnow, who is a retired U.S. Navy pilot, was one of the guys taking one of these small planes to Norfolk. And I guess they made the first three stops great. And he woke up in, what's the name of the town? He woke up in Pago Pago, which is an American Samoa. Okay, on uh, on you know on the third stop of the journey, and that was going to be the, the the final flight to go from Pago Pago, American Samoa, to Norfolk Island, um, Australia. And so on that morning, woke up, you know, took off, and uh, and then started to you know like get where he thought he was going to get, and using the instruments that he was using, started to be like, okay, I should be here, and he started to look down, and there was no island. He couldn't find the island. And so he used some of his radio technology and stuff and ended up finding out pretty quickly that his automatic direction finder, um, you can look that up, but his automatic direction finder um, had started malfunctioning and wasn't working. So now he was lost in the South Pacific Ocean. And I don't know if you know anything about the South Pacific Ocean, but it is a lot of just ocean. It is vast, it is huge, um, biggest ocean in the world, and, and it is, it, it's, it's, it's kind of a hopeless situation that he started to find himself in. So he filed you know, the emergency and to air traffic control, and air traffic control said, hey, the only plane in your vicinity is Air New Zealand Flight 103 from Fiji to Auckland, which I've been on this flight. I don't think it was called 103, but I've been on Air New Zealand from Fiji to Auckland. And, um, and there's 88 passengers on board. And so this plane now was going to hunt this other plane down. But, um, but you know, the, all they had was a radio. And they're talking back and forth. And it's like the blind, oh, uh, I guess, 
trying to lead somebody that's blind and lost. And 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 so they, you know, they're, they're trying to figure out, well, how the heck do we find them? And so they know that based on the, the, the radio that they had, they knew they were th within 400 miles of them. So the, you know, the, the pilot was a navigator and he was like, okay, uh, and he figured out this smart stuff through the sun. And he said, okay, we're just going to both start facing the setting sun. And he was able to figure something out with the direction and facing the setting sun and, and stuff. And then, and then it was, the, the sun was setting. So he had them take notes of when the sun set on Norfolk Island that day, um, based on meteorologists or whatever. And then, and then when the sun set for him in that plane in the exact time. And, and through that, he was able to deduce and get, get it down to 200 miles. They were able to use these short term radios. They were within 200 miles of each other. And then they use this technique with these radios, like Wigan out, it's like Morse code for, for, for radios called oral boxing. And through the oral boxing, they were able to get, you know, relatively close. And when they got relatively close, the pilot, everybody in the plane, they had all 88 passengers like peering out the window looking for them. And, 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 and so they, they knew they were getting somewhat close and they tried to do like a vape, vapor trail. And so they were dumping gas to try to like, you know, can the guy see us, you know, through dumping gas and a vape trail, you know, out in the, uh, and everything. And then once they knew they were pretty close, okay, the pilot was like, okay, guys, hit the strobe, hit the strobe hit the strobe and just like shine it everywhere out there. And, and so soon enough, the, the, the pilot of the Cessna 188, he wanted to give up before then. The pilot had to talk him into to not like taking his own life and just diving the plane into the ocean. And so, so finally he sees light, okay? He sees light. And it wasn't the plane light, it was an oil rig. But through finding this oil rig that was kind of floating out in the, you know, in the ocean, they, they were able to all kind of find each other and then the big plane was able to take them home. And the point that I'm trying to say is this, okay? Is that let the light, okay? Let the light, Jesus, provide the hope that you're searching for. But in turn, be the light that provides hope and brings people home. See, I don't know where you're at today, but Jesus, what he wants to do is he wants to lead your next steps. He wants to bring healing to areas of your life, and he wants to provide hope in all circumstances to guide you home. So what he wants more than anything for you is to get rid of the cell phone pocket light and to turn on the spotlight and be a light in the world this Halloween. Man, we're going to move into the time of communion during this next song. It's where we remember that Jesus was the light of the world and that he died for us so that we could be forgiven, so that we get hope, that we have a second chance, so we can have all of those things. So I'm just going to invite you to take a drink and to take a bit of food and to remember the body of Jesus that was broken and the blood of Jesus that was spilled out for your hope and for your light. Um, so it's in your name, Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. It's in your name that we... Um, confess all of these things. It's in your name that we put our hope. It's in your name that we put our, our, our leadership. It's in your name that we put our, our healing, Lord. Um, and, and we just ask for those things, that you would be the light in our lives and that we would be the light in this world. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.
seated in the heavenly place undefeated with the one who has conquered it all Heavenly place undefeated With the one who 